Okay, chapter two, installing Windows Server 2008. Not radically different than installing Windows 7. What you will have to do for those of you who tried to start your machines, and nothing happened. You know why nothing happened? Because there are no DVDs attached. You're going to have to go into the properties first thing and go out to the DVD and go into the known uh, disks and attach the Windows Server 2008 DVD. Then you should be able to boot to it. When you do the install, I think I've made an IDE drive that's 100 gig. Use that one to do the install on. There are two SCSI drives, which we'll use later on when we do raids. And when you do it, I ask you to format it to 50 gig. That way we have three disks that have unpartitioned space on it so that we can actually create a RAID 5, do those kinds of things when we get to that part of the class. But this one, the objectives plan, and make the appropriate preparations for installing Windows Server 2008. The planning and appropriate preparations, again, you're going to do in the lab portion of it, of the class. In this part, the, we'll call this the lecture part, which also has labs, but we're just going to do the install, do the mechanics of it. Understand the different installation methods used to install Windows Server 2008, and there are a couple that they go through. We'll go through those. Basically, DVD and, and WDS server are the, are the ones. You can also image it, image it, create your own image. Said from the configure, from the initial configurations tasks window, you go through. I ask you to do a couple of configurations there. The first thing that you have to do, which is really a good thing that they changed on a server after you install it, is change the password. Please use capital P password one. Otherwise, I'll have to rip your machine out and make you start over. That's the only way I can look at stuff. Please do that. And please don't get on anybody else's machine. We haven't had any issue with that. I probably shouldn't have brought it up. But if you really want me to be a pain, do that. Go try to help somebody by being unhelpful. Few people, not any of you guys, I've had people that just want to play games. Well, doesn't do anybody any good. Because if you're struggling, you really don't need that. And if you're making good pace, you want to keep the pace up. So please don't do that. Activate Windows Server 2008. We ain't going to do that. You will have to use the uh, service manager, the license manager, SL manager, at least once, I think, in order to rearm it. Activate. And one of the things about Activate goes back to install. Be sure that you install the version what you bought. Because if you install Enterprise and try to <clears throat> put in the license and activate the license for uh, a standard edition, it's not going to work. So when you do this for real, do that. And again, we're just going to use the uh, Enterprise has, has more, as you, as you saw in the earlier one, a little bit more capability than does the uh, than does the standard. Install and configure the Windows deployment service. Yes, you're going to do that. And in the in the lab, I tell you that yes, there is a domain controller already there, and it should already be running. There is a DHCP server. It's already there. It's on the domain controller, and I give you the IP address of it. So. Those things are there, and that's one of the requirements for Windows Deployment Service. Active Directory has to be there. It doesn't have to be on that machine, but it has to be available. And DHCP has to be available, and DNS has to be available before any of those things will work. Install Service Packs. We're not going to have to do that because the one that you have, the DVD, has Service Pack 2 on it. Be careful when you do Service Packs. And this is just based on, again, the experience that I had this weekend on the new server I installed. Hey, Service Pack, that should be okay, right? I installed Service Pack 2 on the R2 server that we're trying to use for the virtual machines. And the virtual machines quit working. Or actually, the management of the virtual machines quit working. So I took the Service Pack back off. That can be an issue, especially if you have different, I guess, degrees or different progressions of servers and different progressions of applications available. Be sure those work. This is this is one of those places that virtualization can come in handy. Try those things out. Try them out on a virtual machine before you put them on a production machine. You see this happen 
frequently. I see it happen frequently. I'm sure you do too. It's somebody's going to do an upgrade. They did that with our uh, with our uh, clock a couple weeks ago. Do this major upgrade. Didn't work. <laughs> I mean, this, they don't just service this company. You know, I mean, this is a this is a company that's in Minnesota. I can't imagine how many companies they service. It took like three days to get it running. How do you do that? Try that stuff out before you ship it out to the masses. And virtual machines are a way to do that because you can create these things relatively quickly. You can install them relatively quickly. You can use them for 120 days. Yes? With virtual machines, can you run like accelerated programs the video is the problem, uh, no, because you don't have you don't have the advanced uh, video available on them. Hyper-V has more capability than the one that we're using. But basically, yeah, yeah, probably not. You can try it, but I don't think the advanced the advanced video capability is not is not available. There's more capability available in Hyper-V than it is Server 2003. Troubleshoot installation problems. Hopefully there won't be any many of those. And if it's an installation problem, the easiest troubleshooting may be, okay, here's the CD, the DVD, let me just do this, because it doesn't really take that long. And if, if you've got some pretty good hardware, it really doesn't take very long to do it. Uninstall Windows Server 2008. Yeah, right. F disk. And have and have all your all your data backed up. Hardware requirements, and I think I ask you to do that. I just want you to know that that's there. That you can check the hardware requirements because that is becoming a bigger and bigger issue as we get into. The more they try to make them the same, the more they become different. 2008, 2008 R2, 2008 R2 Service Pack One, Service Pack Two. Each of those becomes a little bit different as you go through them. Disk partitioning options, and this is in the preparation. How much space do you want? How do you determine it? I can tell you that I want you to partition to 50 gig. One of the things to be careful of in all Windows installations, back to Windows 2000, which told you to put it on a partition X size, and you need it about two or three times X as you started doing updates and as you started installing stuff and as it started growing. You already have noticed, I'm sure, that Windows grows. It never gets any smaller. It just grows. So be sure that your system partition is big enough for the, for the server to keep running. The other thing that will happen to you on servers more so than on workstations, check the log files every once in a while. Move the log files. Delete the log files. I've gotten on servers that have been running for a couple of years, and you have two or three gig worth of log files on and you know nobody's reading them because you got two or three gig worth of log files. Put them someplace else. Look at the log files. Read the log files. Understand the file system. We'll go through the file system again, NTFS and the way we do shares. This is something that the little dose that we had in Windows 7 hopefully got you going on it. But this is something that you really need to understand is the file system and how to manage the file system. Uh, Windows 2008, if you have a larger than, greater than 2 terabyte partition, it will automatically go to a good partition. It's, I mean, it's, in, the other, in the Windows 7, they said, oh, you got to put it in there, da 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 If you get that big, it'll just do it for you because it doesn't want to use NTFS on it. Upgrade options, there aren't many, and I ask you to look at those so we won't really talk about those. In the, in the lab itself. Basically, 2003, enterprise to enterprise, standard to standard or standard to enterprise. You can, just like all the other upgrades, you can go up, but you can't go down. You can't, enter, you can't upgrade an enterprise to a standard, for instance. Using licensing, and I think that James asked that question a little earlier. I usually just take the default and put in like 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 enough license. The default is going to be five. And you want to use per user 
because per user, like we have in here, 20 machines. If I did a per seat, I would have to have 20 licenses. If only 10 of you were going to be logged on at a time and I did a per user, then I only need 10 licenses because when Trevor logged off, Robert logged on, they can use the same license. But a per seat has to be for every workstation that's going to connect to it. That's the, that's the plan of user licensing, how many you need. And you don't have to buy them all right now. You can, you can add licenses as you go, as the company expands. Domain or work group membership, we've done that. Choose a computer name. This is something that used to be when we did a common install, we were doing a, a NetWare server because we only had one and everybody used it to manage us. Like, what well, we got to name the server? That would take the most time. Have a naming convention. And the naming convention I would ask you to use is CIS 2510 whatever your server number is. Just seems simple enough to do that. The one that I use is CIS 2510-00. So I use the naming convention with it and start out with a number that we won't use. Whether install core or the full version. Core is going to have advantages. It's also going to have disadvantages. You're going to have to either know how to script it or know be pretty good at the command line. But once you get it up and running, you can, again, manage it remotely. It probably does have some advantages from the manage it remotely in that somebody can't sit down at it and open the GUI. It's, it might save you some, some time there. Implement the server role. Implement, identify the and implement. Identify which server roles. What's it going to do? It's going to be a file server, print server, distribution server, a deployment server, a web server, whatever, and take a look at what's available, how you add those things. It's a little different than it used to be. Windows Server 2003 was uh, add remove Windows components. Here he's going to do it through the uh, server manager. Uh, determine the immediate preparations, hardware requirements, plan for growth, RAID, and we'll, when we do the disks, we'll do RAID. Hardware RAID versus software RAID, you cannot install the operating system on a software RAID because the software manages the RAID and the software has to be loaded before the RAID works, so it won't work. You can put it on a hardware RAID. Talk about RAID 5. The one that is popular, the RAID that is popular right now is a RAID 10, a RAID 1 0, which is a which is striping with mirror. Actually, I guess it should be a RAID 0 1, shouldn't it? But gives you the speed of the stripe and the redundancy of the mirror. It takes a lot of disk space in order to do that. The hardware. Windows Server Catalog of Tested Products, and they've got the address in there. They keep changing it. It used to be really simple for years. It was Microsoft.com forward slash HCL, and then they decided they want to call it the Windows Catalog. And now it's got several different, different ones. You can find it. If you go to HCL, I think it does an automatic redirect to it. But the hard, formerly known as the Hardware Compatibility Test, check to see if you need a BIOS upgrade before you do these things. It may be that you do need to upgrade the BIOS before 2008 works. may mean that Windows 2008 won't work on it. I've got a server at home that I tried to put server 2008 on, and the problem was not the motherboard, but the RAID controller doesn't have a driver for 2008. It just says no. What kind of partition are you going to use? And you're going to do that. We're going to use the existing partition. You can dual boot these things if you want. I don't know why you would really want to on a server. You could always do that. And then that, what that really did was give, in NT4, give Microsoft the ability to ask a lot of questions because NT4, the only common, FAT32, FAT you couldn't use FAT32. It only recognized the FAT16. So they, they, they had all sorts of questions if you do a boot of which, which partitions could you use on either an NT4 or a server 2003 because that was more popular then than now, I think. 2003 will direct upgrade to 2008, kind of, as long as you don't have things like a PowerShell service pack. When you get into here, and this one has already got these things configured, it's going to probably create a small partition for it Windows to use. Just let it Windows do that. Don't try to 
force it into something that you want it to do and it doesn't want to do. You're going to have an option down here when you start up, I believe, to create the partition. And again, you're going to have, and I think they're 127 gig. They may be bigger than that. I think they're 127 gig, and there's one that's 100 gig. The 100 gig is the one that you want to install the operating system on. NTFS is the native one. We talked about that one a little bit in Windows 7. And again, we'll talk about it more when we talk about the file system. Portable operating systems interface is supposed to allow uh, platform neutrality in applications. And Windows does support this. And it, it the modules for it is growing, but they're not there. Journaling is something that is kind of handy, and I think Linux has been using journaling for a long time, hasn't it? What journaling does is, as something before something gets installed, it gets entered into the journal, so that the system crashes and it starts back up, it checks the journal, knows where to go back to, to keep going. Hard link is something that's kind of handy, and I think the example that they use, and it probably is a good example, hard link refers to a particular file. If you had maybe like a policy document, and you wanted that policy document stored in 1,462 different places, or at least five. You could create a hard link to the source document and only have to change the source document. The hard link would then use that source document. You can do that with web pages, too. It says self-healing disks. What this does is before, if we had a problem with the disk, we had to run check disk and restart it. It will go clean it up, fix the errors on the disk for you while the, while the system is running. Upgrading, and this table is in the book. Take a look at this table of just what's going to the 2003 to 2008. Basically, it's a enterprise to enterprise or from a lower to a higher uh, version of it. Uh, client access, licenses, CALs. 5 to 25 for standard enterprise editions. Additional CALs can be added. And when you install this thing, I think the default is like it defaults to 5. And you know how you tell it you have more? Put a different number in. Microsoft doesn't count very well. If they ever come to check you, they'll count real well. They'll know how many you're supposed to have, how many CALs. Again, educational licensing is different than anything else. The company buys licenses based on the number of students that we have, so we basically get free run of the uh, of the resource. When you get in business, it's not going to be that way. If you need to add access li uh, licenses, you can do that. It's just a matter of going in and, and adding the cows once you buy the cows uh, from the system. Data center and itanium, a flat cost per processor, X per processor. Microsoft licenses. Servers based on processors, not cores. Flat licensing is not on a per processor basis for these two editions. Initial configurations tasks when to specify the work group or domain. Again, you're going to see that, ask you to configure that. So I won't talk about that a lot. The default is work group. Change the work group name to CIS 2510 just, just to go through and see how that thing works change the time zone. Once you get the initial configurations and so on done, please be sure you put the VM additions on your virtual machine. Otherwise, you're going to be cussing me for a long time. Because it's painful, and you can't get your mouse back unless you use the right alt key. The servers are more efficient than the workstations, I think. It just appears to me that they are. The naming conventions, I'm not going to tell you how to name them. I'm going to tell you how to name the ones for the labs. But when you start doing these things, I want to say is have a naming convention so that you have the 600 computers and you get this message from your centralized antivirus software that computer 612 has a virus. Where is it? You need to be orderly about those things. And if you are a big company and you're at the headquarters, you may not even know which site it's in. Naming convention can be important for both computers and users. So do those, have those. And I think in the, uh, actually I do know, in the 
lab portion of the course, you're going to have to come up with a naming convention. Doesn't that be anything dramatic? Just think about how am I going to identify these machines? Our company, we're RKE, Virginia Beach is VAB, and I know they're each different ones, so that if you get something from one of those machines, you at least know which network administrator to contact, what's going on. So naming conventions can be a big deal. Uh, whether you install the core or the full version, a lot of people like the core version because of the limited attack surface. I like the core version for the limited attack service if you have an exposed attack surface, and that's me. Inside a network, unless I was going to say you have some really weak resources, and we'll say some really weak resources, just from a convenience standpoint, I would put in the full version. If a machine's sitting in this building and not exposed to the Internet, except for you guys, what's the real threat? So that's a decision you have to make, and you have to balance all of those things. What are you going to do? Who's going to be managing it? If you're putting it in for a dentist who's going to be managing it himself, you're probably going to want the good. If you're, if you're, of course, if you're, you wouldn't be putting it in for some geek, but if you were, then they probably would learn how to use or know how to use the command prompt. It's different. It's doable. It's slow to start with. I'm still pretty slow at it. Lots of good help, like in the net shell command to set an IP address. Use the question mark. It'll tell you what goes next. Use the help functions. Always use, and if you're taking tests, Microsoft doesn't give you the same help function that uh, Cisco does because they don't actually have you do a lot of labs either. But when you're doing this stuff, use the help function. Just follow it down. Server roles. A number of different ones of those shared directories. I'm not going to go through the list. I ask you to take a look at them as you go through. A couple of additions here, the certificate server, uh, domain services role. Federation services are used to authenticate people via web. And what that's for is if, if you want to, and they'll, they'll always say, you just got a different company. You could use federation services to allow those users to authenticate to your web services, to, to those kinds of things. Lightweight directory services is not a full version. You can't actually make changes to Active Directory, but you can manage access to applications using Active Directory. Kind of a play on words. Active Directory Rights Management, DRM, Digital Rights Management. It allows you to, if you once you set this up, to do things like we can make a Word document, you know, all these things that they didn't want people to be able to copy files or to print files and to do this, you can do all that with DRM, but you have to be able to manage it that way. Digital rights management is a role. That's be these are beyond the scope of this course. They're function of the Active Directory portion of it. Uh, application server, component, component object, DHCP, DNS, things that you've seen before, fax, at least a term you've used before, file services and Hyper-V roles, all different roles. This is not a, a complete list. When you do look at the role, it, it's not a real big list. There are not many more, but there are some others when you look at the list in the, uh, in the server management. Policy assessment, print services, terminal services, UDI services, web services, I guess we will get through them all. Deployment services, and that basically is the list of services that are available. And here is what it's going to look like. It's, they've always got it before you begin, ser server roles, Active Directory. Then this one that's grayed out, Windows Deployment Services grayed out, says install because of Windows Deployment Services that have been installed on whatever machine this one is on. And these are all the ones that you can be. Unlike, you guys didn't have to do the Server 2003. Server 2003, when you added things, you frequently would be asked for the CD. It's probably not going to happen here because more disk space, more convenience, more things loaded, more things installed, but it takes more disk space in order to do that. Create a backup if you're upgrading pre-installed hardware. 
disconnect removable storage devices. And kind of one of the things that we just did, you just saw us did on, on the server that we're using is we're going, for, not really on an upgrade, we're going to a new server, is we disconnected a, at least kind of a portable storage, a nice SCSI partition and connected it to the new one. But take those things off before you do, disconnect all that stuff before you do and then put it back on. Uh, disconnect uh, UPS connections, the, the uh, uninterruptible power supplies, uh, hard drives for new peripherals, on and on. And these are all things that hopefully have or will think about. Primary methods of Windows Server 2008 installation, the DVD, upgrade from Server 2003, install a virtual server using Hyper-V. You're going to install a virtual server, not using Hyper-V. Windows Deployment Services. You can use Windows Deployment Services to install a virtual machine, all those other things, uh, as long as you can get connectivity to them. I did, I said I did an upgrade of the server. I have a Windows 2008 Ranger, and then we have the one that's still running, which is 2003. It went okay. First I did first I virtualized it and then upgraded and the advantage to the to that was I kept running into little problems. Like you would get somewhere and it say can't upgrade because of uh, uh, PowerShell was installed. Can't do that. Gotta uninstall PowerShell. Can't upgrade because I don't know, front page or something was installed on the IIS server that I didn't even know was installed on the IIS server. Can't do that. So what I wound up doing eventually was doing it as a virtual with undo disks, and then when I ran into a problem, I could go back to where I started the initial time. When you're doing virtual machines, undo disks or snapshots are things that you want to take advantage of. Before you do something, configure that, get it ready to go, move forward, and if that doesn't happen, before you commit the changes to the disk, and they, they keep a file of all your changes, and then if you want them to be saved, you commit them to the disk, and then they become a permanent part of the disk. But you can always undo things. To me, a real advantage when you're trying to do something different, new, and you don't want to keep reinstalling or rebooting or read this or read that, just do it with undo disks in the, uh, in the DVD. In the, uh, Virtual disk. DVD installation, nothing magic here that you've done before. Bootable from a DVD device, insert the DVD, turn the computer off, turn it on, follow the installation instructions. <coughs> Install now. We have down here what you need to know before installing Windows, the same things that we have had before. Install now, and then we're going to obviously click set up, click install now. As a virtual server, uh, First set up the virtual server and yours are already set up. I guess just keep going. The What we do in our virtual servers and what we do in Hyper-V, same basic steps. Again, is Hyper-V going to be more efficient? Yes. Are you going to get a better utilization of the hardware from Hyper-V? Yes. Are you going to get the web interface so that you can go home and finish your server 2008 install? No. And I guess I'm kind of justifying why we haven't done that yet, because it's it. I think right now where we've been able to find this does the most for you to be able to have the flexibility to work when you whenever you have the opportunity. Windows deployment services. We looked at that a little bit in the Windows 7 class. What the Windows deployment services is. We load the DVD onto this service, do a PXE boot to the NIC, and install it over the network. Been around for years. Before it was WDS, it was RISC server, remote installation server. So the concept's not anything new. The ability to do it's not anything new. It is there. Yours is going to have a bigger list when you get there of which ones. And you're going to have the option to do the core. If you really feel brave, you can go ahead and do the core install. But I wouldn't recommend it because all the labs are written for the GUI. It is, and if you want to, and later on, maybe we do a core install just to see what's there and, and what you can do with it. Because it is something that I think a number of businesses want to use because it costs a little less, takes a little less hardware, 
more efficient and it is less prone to uh, somebody getting on to it. Invasion. Upgrade or custom unless you have server 2003 installed and running. The only way you can upgrade this Windows is to have the current operating system running. 2003, you booted to the CD and said, oh, I found this version of Windows. Do you want to upgrade? One of the options would be to upgrade if it were already there. It has to be running here. What you can do is a custom because you've got nothing to upgrade. And we're back to next, next, load drivers. If you come up to this segment and there is nothing, it shows up with a blank and you know you've got disks for real, you may have to load drivers. You may have to provide the drivers for it if, if it's not in its driver set. Customize the server, and these are all the – this is what you're going to look at. Set the time zone, configure networking, put your static – this is not anything that you couldn't do with just going to the networking portion of the uh, of the control panel. It's just go through this just to see what it does, have you do some things. Download and install updates turned out – or excuse me. Enable automatic updating, have you disable that. Provide a computer name, name your computer there based on the uh, what you have here. And then uh, a little later after you do that, and this is when I say you don't have to have this thing start up. Do not show this at log on. If you don't check this, every time you start up, this is what you're going to see. Actually, depending on how fast the machine is, about the time you get in the middle of doing something, this is what you're going to see. Because it doesn't always start out immediately. Before the short activation period expires or renew the short activation period, uh, and it's going to tell you it can't activate, but it's going to run for the 30 days, and then you can extend it three more times for 30 days, and that's what we're going to do. There's no need for the short amount of time we're going to use these things to burn a license and then activate the server. WDS, install a server 2008 Vista and Windows 7. The ability to install a Windows Server 2003 and Windows XP, you can, and there there's some uh, backward compatibility in order to be able to use WDS to install XP. It's different because in XP, it's an x86 system. In this one, remember we had a boot WIM and an install WIM. You have to have both of those in order to make these things install. These things, the server 2003 and XP didn't have a boot WIM. It didn't have any kind of a WIM. You have to create that. Uh, updated Buddha format, image-based installation techniques. When you do the, if you do the, you're going to install here. I actually have the uh, Active Directory lab class install it and install their Windows 7 machine using the WDS. It's not difficult. You install the service and then you right-click and load the boot WIM and right-click and load the install WIM in the correct location, have DHCP, Active Directory, and DNS on it, boot so that your window, so that your machine with no operating system can get a DHCP address from your deployment server and be ready to hit F12 because it doesn't last very long. You get ready after, you, after it goes away the first time. But F12 and then just go through the uh, setup. You can put answer files into where it, where it does, it answers all the questions for you automatically when you go through this thing. One of the additions to WDS is, is the ability to multicast, network efficiency. Multicast, it starts a multicast session and it will repeat the multicast session. And the multicast session starts and Robert boots his machine. But maybe Jason got a little late and did get his machine booted on time or some slowdown or whatever else, got held up in a meeting for a few minutes. Jason boots his machine, it will start copying the files at that point. The next time the multi-cast session comes around, he'll get the rest of the files. After he gets all the files, then the system will start the installation. What that prevents that RISC server did is each machine having a connection to the server, an individual connection, unicast connection to the server and downloading the files. It, it multicasts, it sends the files 
to you, so it becomes more efficient. PXC, boot to the NIC. If you haven't done that and you want to do that, we can set this up pretty quickly in order to, actually we can do that, I can give you, a, if you want, I can give you a blank machine and you can do that because I've already got that set up to where it'll work. You're going to install WDS on your own machines. The issue becomes, and it was the issue with the lab class that did that, once one of them does it, you got to turn off the DHCP server or you wind up, <laughs> or you wind up installing from the wrong machine. Because DHCP, whichever one gets there first is the one that wins. <clears throat> WDS got to have DNS, DHCP, Active Directory Domain, and NTFS file system. When you install, use the NTFS file system. I don't think it's really going to give you an option to do anything other than do that. When you install it, it's going to tell you, oh, you're about to put this on the C drive. You sure want to do that? In reality, you don't want to do that for the lab. Not a big deal. Because what you don't want to do is put things that have disk requirements on the same drive, physical drive in this case, that the operating system has because it has to keep going back and getting information. Deployment server and a transport server, you'll have to select both of these when you install it. And the really neat thing, I think, about this server manager wizard is if you install something and it needs supporting roles, it doesn't just ignore you. It tells you what else it needs to add. You have to say, okay, but it tells you. I need these other services. Do you want me to install them for you while I'm doing that? Just say yes and let it do it. Otherwise, you're going to have to go back and figure out what you need to do. The path, see, colon backslash remote install is right, uh, right now go ahead and take the uh, defaults. The, the reason that you can change that is in reality, would you want that installed on your C drive? Because if you keep putting stuff on there, it's going to grow bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually you're going to shut down your operating system because of the number of images that you have on C. Unattended installation, and they talk about that. This has unattended, but we really don't have an unattended file. We can tell it to do that, but it's going to be looking for unattended installation to browse what file we're going to use, what XML file we're going to use for the unattended. I've got an x86, an Itanium, and a 64-bit architecture. You can have different unattended files for the different architectures, and it'll detect the architecture. Server core. Basically the same steps, actually it is the same steps until you get there and then you have a command prompt and that's it. You're not going to get all of those nice things. Service packs, update security, fix, fix those problems, download from the Microsoft site. I did download the service pack if you want to put on the one that's already there, but there's no need to do that. The service pack is already installed. This is one, again, just based on the experience I had this weekend, you probably want to try this stuff out before you say, okay, let's just go do it. Because it shut down some services that we actually needed because of compatibility. Then you've got to go back and find out what you've got to do in lieu of that. Back up the server. And backing up the server is kind of an easier job now, isn't it? How would you back up your server? I know with the backup software. What if you made a full system image and it didn't work and it wouldn't uninstall? I was fortunate this one just uninstalled. I thought it wasn't going to get, get hung up and work forever and ever and ever in the mind. I said, well, I'm done. I need to reboot now. But a system image. And if it didn't work, you could boot to the media and restore the entire computer. Things that are available now, the backup and restore Probably is easier, may take a little bit more space, but probably is easier because of the imaging that's there. Problems that occur, Windows update, in reality you would have that turned on. In the lab I would like for you to have that turned off. Hardware compatibility, and I think this is becoming a bigger and bigger, bigger deal, although I think that more and more and more hardware is compatible with these things, or there's less hardware that's incompatible. Hard drive tests, what goes on on these things. Troubleshooting the installation, uninstalling it. Here you go. What we said up front, how do you uninstall it? I think it should, up here should say first, back up your data. Install another operating system, F disk or format. What they're saying is blow it away and put the other operating system on it. Disk part, 
This part's the command line tool, and it is one that you probably want to learn how to use because it is handy to have. You can, with the Enterprise Edition of Windows 7, for instance, create a bootable uh, virtual hard drive so that you could go to your Windows XP machine and follow in the instructions, which I don't have on the top of my head, but this part is part of those instructions, and put a virtual hard drive on, this, on the XP machine and have a dual boot arrangement, one that's on the physical drive and one that's on the virtual drive. When you boot to the virtual drive, the what we would think of as a C drive becomes the D drive, the virtual drive is the C, and the other way around. The C drive, the physical drive is the C, and the, uh, and the virtual drive is the D or E or whatever else it is. So what I do when we get ready to install is to check the hardware. We're not going to check the hardware for the lab because it's virtual. It does work. Try it out. The hardware that we have on the physical machine is certainly compatible. Uh, the, please be sure when you get done to put the VM additions on to the machine. Activate immediately after installation for real, and again, for the lab, we're not going to do that. You have to have bought what you're installing. Service packs, the troubleshooting suggestions. Uninstall by reformatting, repartitioning. Actually, I think if I were going to make this go away, I would kill the partition and start over with a new partition instead of just a format. Questions? I know you're ready to do labs for the next little bit, right? Going once, going twice. <laughs>